So I've got a couple of stone working tools to make and I am referencing one of my favorite books. This is American Blacksmithing by Holmstrom and Holford and it's by two authors because it's actually two books in one volume. So the second book in the volume is called the 20th Century Toolsmith and Steelworkers Manual and it has extensive sections on making stone working tools. When making any of these tools, use steel of 75 points carbon. So, a hundred years ago, most steel on the market was just plain carbon steel. So it wasn't alloyed, it was just iron with carbon added. Um, and they referred to it with this point system. So a 75 point steel was 0.75% carbon, which is the same, nowadays we would say it as a 1075, that would be the, the, the US industry standard label for that steel would be 1075. So anything between 1075 and 1085 is gonna be, gonna match what he's calling for pretty well. So I have here, this is a piece of junkyard steel. So this, this was originally some sort of stone working um, tool. That's what I'm gonna make my drill out of. And then the second tool is going to be a pitching chisel, and I have a piece of one inch round um, 1084 to make that out of. So here he says, a pitching tool is made from one inch octagon steel, but to form the cutting edge, the steel must be upset a great deal. The cutting edge of a pitching tool for all soft stone should be slightly beveled, as indicated in this picture. Um, so this is the tool right here, Alan, that we are, that I'm gonna make. It's called a pitching tool or a pitching chisel, even though it's not really a chisel. Mm. So this piece of metal right here is gonna be made into that tool. Mm. So that's the one I'm gonna make first. That one's the most difficult, and then we'll make the drill. Mm. All right, let's get started. So to upset, the end of a bar, upsetting in, in blacksmithing terms. Upsetting is the process of driving, collapsing the metal into itself, which makes it grow in cross section or diameter. And so we're gonna try to um, heat just a couple of inches of the end of this bar and then upset it into itself to make it grow. I need plenty of material behind the edge mass to support the edge because stone working tools take great abuse. So I don't want to quench this a lot, but I just want to isolate the heat just a little. So I'm going to cool the end a little bit. All right, so you can see how the steel is growing in diameter as it collapses back into itself. Metal's hot. This is a real guessing game as to how much material I need on the end. But I'm gonna 
I'm gonna take another good thorough upsetting heat. What are you gonna make out of that? Nothing? Pretending, pretending you're making it what? In, you gonna make it make it into a hook? Yeah. Because it's a little bit big. A little bit hot. Hopefully, it didn't damage it. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up the shaft behind the blade area a little bit before I continue upsetting things. All right, that's a little better. I've tried to dress it back down close to the starting size. And now we're going to keep continue upsetting the blade. What I would really like is for the edge to be about two inches across and the body to be, the sides to be parallel at least for an inch or so. I don't wanna do this too fast because I really don't want to cause cracks but I need the part that I want to move the most, the hottest. Alright, I'm going to call that good. If I had more time, I would go ahead and octagonalize the handle. Ah, oh, shoot, it won't take long. We'll just do it. Whoa! Good thing you had those no-spill lids. Whoa, thank you. Mm. Throwing it in the dirt. <laughs> thank you, girls. We'll keep the scale off of it at this point. I'm just going to dress up the body a little bit. It's 
Purdy. Crazy to think how much material is in that blade. That piece literally started as that long. What I don't know is how long I ought to leave the handle. I'm thinking roughly eight inches overall would be appropriate, but I think I will just leave it all for now and ask some of my stonemason friends for length. Definitely not the prettiest tool I've ever made. I think it's good enough to put my name on. Hey Jordan, what's going on? <laughs> well, I'm right in the middle of forging myself a uh, two inch wide pitching chisel, or whatever you call it, pitching tool, right. for limestone. And my question was, um, how long overall? Overall length, about eight inches or so? Yeah, including the head? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fine. Uh, yeah, because you basically just you want to think about it like you want enough room for the head, enough room for your hand to grip, and you want enough room extra for like when you're going to have to, you know, uh, take it to a grinder and clean off the burrs. Cool. So if you go too short, whenever the more you have to clean up the burrs, the more steel you lose, right? Right. So give yourself a little bit. I think eight should be fine. Cool. I think it's perfect. I don't think I'll have to trim anything off. Great. I'll send you a picture when I'm done. We're we're making a video of it too, so anyway. Awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm fixing to use it as soon as it's done. <laughs> are you going uh are you going for a pitching chisel? I like what angle are you putting on that for the the angle of the the uh I'm I'm open to suggestions. So my my book that I'm looking at it's like, yeah, some of them are angled and some of them are square, so you tell me. Well, so if it's a straight 90 and it's flush and flat, it's technically a set. Okay. And that's used mostly for, like, facing stone. Mm -hmm. A pitching chisel has, I think, it's still a 90 square face, but the square is on an angle. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a, I would say that... that I would I would say put it on an angle because it would give you you can use it for more things. A straight set is pretty much just using for facing stone. Okay. That makes it easy. It's already that way. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well thanks a bunch. Sorry for the cold call. No problem. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> All right, take care, man. Stay warm. All right. Bye. Gosh. All right. Let's dress up this struck end a little bit. I shouldn't have hammered on it while it was uh, not hot enough. I got a lot of fish mouthing because I did. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, hot rasp some of that fish mouthing out. Actually, I may just hammer some of it out too. Brush that off and see what it looks like. I can live with that. I could crown it nicely, but I think it'll be just fine. It'll get worn off anyway. See if I can keep it straight, relatively. <laughs> I do believe that worked.
but that's non-magnetic right there. Yep, so the magnet sticks here, but it's hot enough down here it doesn't stick. So we're gonna brush that off one more time and let it air cool as I said. So for the steel for the drill, we're just gonna use this piece. This was some sort of struck tool, I don't remember what. I think it was a stone working drill actually that I cut a piece off of for another project. But this is three quarter inch um, octagonal and um, we're gonna forge a chisel end on it of sorts. And then we're gonna flatten it. All right, I think I will finish it by grinding. So on a stone drill like this, the cutting edge for soft stone needs to be fairly thin, but the cutting edge needs to be wider than the body of the tool. So the body of the tool is three quarters of an inch and I want the cutting edge about um, seven eighths wide. Not only is that the hole size that I need, but um, that's so that the tool doesn't bind in the hole. So that is as far as we're going to take this with the anvil. And now we're going to let that cool and then do some grinding on it. And then we'll finish the heat treat. So that's forged. Now let's check the pitching tool for temperature and see if yeah, it's still pretty warm. Oh, I hate being pinched for time for heat treat, but we're going to go ahead and normalize again. We're going to call that good. No idea how well it'll work. Seems awfully sharp, but it's um, still not as sharp an angle as shown in the book. So hopefully it'll work. So now it's time to heat treat this and the pitching tool. So again, I'm not really sure if my geometry is correct. I'm not a stonemason, but we'll see how it works. Y'all have warm spots by the fire. <laughs> Y'all know how I'm gonna find out if my steel is at the right temperature? I'm gonna stick a magnet to it, or hold a magnet to it. And I wanna get it just hot enough that the magnet won't stick anymore. Because when the metal gets hot enough, it makes the little atoms or whatever, molecules, like jump around and they won't they won't stick to the magnet. Perfect. So I'm trying not to get a super hard line between cold and hot. And now I'm gonna rub this off, I'm watching for the colors to run. And I'm going to quench it off, leaving the edge practically hard. So tempering takes some of the, quenching make, takes, makes the metal hard. Tempering draws a little bit of the hardness back out of the metal, leaving it tough. And 
and I can temper multiple times. So there's still heat up in, in the bar, further up the bar from the edge. I can rub the colors off again. So you can see that golden color, we call it straw up here. And that color is slowly going to move down toward the edge. One tempering cycle is probably enough, but more definitely can't hurt. As long as the temper isn't drawn past too far, any of the times, you can temper it as many times as you like. And a lot of blacksmiths do their tempering in an oven where it holds it at a specific temperature for a long period of time. What these colors are is those are actually showing what temperature the metal is. They're oxidization colors that correspond to temperature. No, I don't remember exactly what that temperature is. All right, we're gonna stop it right there. And I'm going to, that's ice water, which isn't intentional, it's just, it's been cold around here. So I'm gonna set that down in the oil, and uh, which isn't quite as aggressive a quench. And I'm just gonna let it sit in the oil while I move to tempering this tool. I'm gonna let that temperature even out. And then you quench it. And I'm shading the edge, which means I do not want a hard line. I don't want to end my quench at the same spot every time. So I want the, I want the metal to be gradually hotter going up the tool. So I, I'm, I'm really, as long as we have enough heat to finish the tempering cycle, I'm really glad that it's, it's happening slowly. And we're gonna just put that into the oil and let it sit there for a little bit. See if this is, okay, this is cooled down enough that quenching it in water won't hurt it. All right, so let's make sure that's cool enough to hang on to. Yeah, I like that. So this one is also ready to be cooled off the rest of the way. It's not burning the oil off anymore, so I know that it's cool enough that it won't be hurt by a bath in the ice water. So we're fixing to get to try these things out. And um, I've got my friend Paul here today. Paul is helping me with a few projects I've got going. He's taking home the components to my woodworking bench. I'm super excited about this. I've had this bench under construction for only about four or five years. <laughs> it's ready for the final assembly and Paul's gonna cut the joinery and put it together. So it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So what I'm gonna do with the pitching tool, hopefully if this works right, is I'm going to break off the edge here. And what I'm trying to do is get a nice broken edge as opposed to that sawn edge from the quarry. No, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I know the effect that I want. So now we're gonna spin this around, do the other side. All right. Pretty rough, but looks better than it did. <clears throat> so I'm going to turn the rock over. And we're going to do the same thing from this side. So I'm going to come back a little bit. You'll notice the tool has a, has a beveled blunt end. So I'm using this corner of the tool, 
right here to, to do to make the actual cut to cut into the stone seems to be holding up perfectly I don't see any cracks it's not even dulling yet hopefully that doesn't mean it's too hard Just trying to remove all the saw marks. So that has held up really, really well. Super happy with that. I think that is a winner. So now it's time to test the drill. So this is the drill. And I am actually going to mount a boot scraper that I made in this block. So we have to drill two holes for the legs of the boot scraper. And then those holes will get filled around the legs of the boot scraper with um, molten lead. So let's try this out. I'm gonna set, well, I could just use this, but I'm gonna set this pair of dividers to the width of the boot scraper. And then I'm gonna use that to mark for my holes. I'm just gonna eyeball it. I like I like that. And all right, that's giving us a nice depression. This one's being a little more stubborn. Here goes nothing. Look at that. It's already really starting to establish the hole. I can definitely see that I should have had more relief behind the edge, or a more drastic relief anyway, but that's okay. That is working quite well. The edge has chipped a little bit, but they're very fine chips. It hasn't, there hasn't been any big catastrophic breaks. So I would consider that just normal dulling. Use Bo's fancy dandy little lens poofer thingy to <laughs> blast the dust out of there. That works nicely too. <laughs> it's amazing how fast you can drill a hole with one of these. I am quite satisfied with my first attempt. So I think these tools are winners and they will do me good service for some time to come. So this block of stone is almost ready to receive this boot scraper. And if you wanna see this put in and see us make the boot scraper, go check out the boot scraper video.